This is CX of M Radio, the voice of customer experience professionals. Hello, and welcome to another World of UX podcast. This is your host, Darren Hood. Thanks, everybody, for taking the time to join us on today. A special welcome to those of you that are listening for the first time. Glad that you took time out of your schedule, all of you to tune in to the show. Um, By the way, we are closing in on yet another anniversary. More information to come about that. I'm pretty uh, excited about that. I'm also excited about a conference that I will be speaking at later on this year. I'll be closing out the day in day three of a four-day conference in Austria for the World Usability Congress. I am so excited about this event. I'm excited about being able to meet and interact with UXers from the other side of the globe over in Europe. This is really exciting for me. I have spoken internationally before, but I've never spoken internationally in person. And so I'm excited for this. I'm really excited to have been handpicked, one of the handpicked people, lots of great speakers, but handpicked to speak at this event. Really, really excited for it. And looking forward to it. So I wanted to give the World Usability Congress a shout out there for considering me and giving me the opportunity to speak. Even then, I'm going to be speaking on the topic, Implementing UX Triage, the Path to UX Restoration. Uh, As mentioned in last week's episode, we've basically lost the battle. For those who who are of the mind of what I call pure UX, if you listen to the show at all before, you've heard me mention the phrase pure UX, there's pure UX, there's UX theater, there is the cult of UX, uh, where the latter two are people who are actually prescribing and doing things that are not really UX. And and sadly, when an organization doesn't understand what UX is, those people are held in regard, they're valued, even though they're not really doing anything, they're just occupying seats, but they're not really driving value. We have to restore UX. Notice that I said we lost the battle. I didn't say we lost the war, so to speak. So there are still things that can be done, things that will be done. I refuse to stop sharing information about what UX really is. I refuse to stop representing what true, what pure UX really is. If people opt out, they opt out, but that doesn't mean I have to join them. It doesn't mean you have to join them. So... Uh, I'm going to be talking about that type of of thing at the conference. I'll be talking about what we have to do in order to restore UX to its former glory. The days when we were understood to a greater extent, the days when we were valued, the days when you actually had to know what you were doing in order to be held in some regard, uh, the days where we didn't have a bunch of non-UXers running UX departments and running the real UXers in the ground and trying to displace us. So a lot of things, a lot of things that are going on today, but there are ways that we can counter what's happening. If there is a path to restoration and there is, there are different things we can do to help the discipline along. So that's what I'll be talking about at the uh, World Usability Congress in October of this year. We are going to continue I mean, yeah, that is sinister, too. Somebody's saying, is that part of sinister? Yeah, it is. <laughs> so if you thought that, you're absolutely correct. Um, we're going to return to part 17, picking up there today as we get ready to bring this topic to a close. And I mentioned last week that the next two to three topics are going to get an episode unto themselves. Uh, topics that just need to be handled from a solo perspective because there are so many examples and these things are so critical that, again, for those people who embrace pure UX, for people who want to see the discipline represented the right way, for the people who want to do actual UX work, um, these things are happening. And, And again, we all make ourselves a committee of one In other words, when you see these things, because you're going to see them, if you haven't already experienced the things I'm talking about, just keep traveling. If you don't see it, that means that you're surrounded by it. (laughs) That means that there's a lot of crazy things. Something that I'm talking about is happening, and there's nothing that's going against the grain or that's highlighting those, those heinous 
sort of malpractice oriented environments when nobody is a threat and when everybody's on board with the with the cult of UX within an organization, then nobody's going to have an issue with that because uh, nobody's rocking the boat. If, if you embrace UX of a truth and something wrong is happening, you're going to rock the boat. And then it's almost like those, that old movie Invasion of the Body Snatchers. As soon as you see a real human being or as soon as they see a real human being, then they all sound the alarm and everybody's out to get you. So uh, and, and, and some people will say, well, that's paranoid. It's not paranoid when they're really after you. And folks, I have not said a single solitary thing that's not happening in UX today. I'm thankful for those of you who have who have reached out to me, who've responded to me to thank me for sharing these things. Uh, a lot of folks won't talk about this. And I got to like as, as part of uh, the little uh, pre segment that I've been doing in each one of these, I got to give a, a shout out. And I mean this in the, in the I hate to use the word negative, but I mean this in a negative way. To all of those who have a a voice in the discipline, all those who are recognized, revered, honored, who are not warning people about these things. All of these things are happening. I have spoken to people before who have a voice, who have a name, who have a reputation, who have a huge brand in the world of UX who will say that, and somebody told me once before, oh, they're not, there's nothing happening with seniors. I haven't seen that at all. Okay, I'm standing here with 10 proverbial or metaphorical hatchets in my back, and you're telling me that they're not in my, I don't have any hatchets in my back? The, it, it, it's sad how people will go into denial or are blind because it's not impacting them individually. So because it's not impacting them individually, matter of fact, I just recall there have been a few people Authors of books, people with big name UX operations, when you talk to them about what's going on, they'll say, oh, no, it's not happening or, well, you know, you need to be quiet about that. And people have been telling me to be quiet about this stuff for over a decade, only for the same exact thing they told me to be quiet about to overrun us. These things have been happening, are happening. If you haven't experienced yet, these things, all you have to do is keep traveling. You're going keep living. And you're going to run smack dab into the things that I'm talking about. And, and if you are not aware of these things and you experience them, it's going to blindside you. You're not going to have a, a, a response already configured in your in your mind, so to speak. And it will floor you. I know people who have left the discipline because they encountered these things and didn't know what to do. And eventually they just threw their hands up and they walked away. So these things are real. Again, that's why we call this, for those of you listening, possibly for the first time, uh, that's why we call this show The World of U.S., because we talk about everything. I'm not going to be in the position I'm in and not warn people about what's happening that could be detrimental to the well-being of your career. I'm not going to know the things that I know and then sit here and put on some rose-colored glasses, get that Pollyanna mindset, become uh, a toxic positivity addict, and then behave as if there's nothing wrong and there's no threats and there's no issues. There's a ton of them. We already, we've already covered, I should say, 61 of them and then a lot of sub-elements. So really, we've covered more than 100 if you were to really count it. And we're going into number 62 today as we go into the home stretch. And folks, these things are real. So, and I'm not going to, all I'm going to do is present the facts. Uh, if, if there's somebody who insists on thinking that these things are not real and they're things that are not of concern, uh, then I'm not going to try to convince them of anything. I don't argue. Well, what a waste of time. What a waste of energy. If you sit around and you're talking to somebody and you're trying to convince them that the sky is blue, uh, I mean, how, how long are you going to continue to try to prove something to them that's blatantly obvious? If, if they don't see it, it's because they don't want to see it. Or, in many cases, when people are saying it doesn't exist, it's because they're part of it, and they don't want the, the spotlight to be on them. So, so these are all standard psychological uh, things that happen consistently in people's minds, things that people experience. We're just bringing them the light, and it really empowers people who do see it, who are trying to overcome it. Uh, that's one of the things that talking about these things will do. Uh, so even for those who try to say, well, this doesn't benefit anybody, I'm not paying attention to them either because I know that they're deluded. 
And I experience this stuff all the time. I talk to people that experience this stuff all the time. And so for the people who are experiencing this, this is a reality. And you do have to have a strategy to counter or you're going to be pretty much lost. You're going to be up the creek without a paddle is what's going to happen. And we don't want to see that for you. I love how somebody told me I was talking to last week. They said, when you process the information that I'm sharing logically and objectively, you will understand that the things that are being shared are being shared for your benefit and they're being shared because we do care. Uh, it, it's amazing as we get into today's t- uh, specific topic or solo topic, it's amazing how people will try to convince you that me and people like me are against you. Uh, and, and and so the topic for today is, before I even get into that story, the, the topic today involves the deceitfulness of cancel culture in UX. Uh, everybody knows what cancel culture is, right? Someone claims that someone does something or someone actually does do something. And when someone does or says a particular thing, there's an outcry. And the byproduct of the outcry is that people look at the person that the outcry is is targeted at or the person whose behaviors or attitudes or actions are being highlighted. And they want everybody to pretty much turn a thumbs down to them, to, to shun them, to no longer want anything to do with them. That's basically what cancel culture is about. Well, there's some cancel culture going on in UX today. And is there a time for cancel culture? Actually, yeah, there is. The deceitfulness of cancel culture that I'm speaking to has to do when someone uses the vehicle of cancel culture in a manipulative way. They try to invoke cancel culture through false means, through slander. And slander is not saying that somebody did a particular thing. It's attributing something to someone that they didn't do. And then want people to take action with regard to the falsehood that's been presented. That's cancel culture and it's manipula- and from a manipulative perspective. So, I mean, think about it. it it's somebody is labeled, uh, in one instance, the first story I'll share, and maybe I'll get back to the other story in a bit. Uh, we, had, we, we had a situation once. I used to do a show. It was me. It was Debbie Levitt's show. Debbie Levitt, Dr. Nick Fine, sharp people in the discipline, people who know their stuff, uh, and myself, and we're all on this show answering questions and, and ask me anything kind of scenario. And and we're known for for speaking our minds. For it's funny they'll they'll say so a little bit of a side note. People will talk about Debbie knowing her stuff. They talk about Doctor Nick knowing his stuff. Uh, and then when they get to me, they'll say I'm opinionated. And and, and it, it's funny how they don't say. Some people might say the other two are opinionated, but I get referred to as opinionated more than other people because that's actually, that's a racist. (laughs) I'm going to dare. No, no, dare. No, you didn't play the race card. You don't get to do something racist and not get called out. If you do something racist, you're going to get called out. That's racist. There is no race card. There is no, no gender card. Either somebody did something or they didn't. It's true or it's not. So let's drop that. Don't, don't get into the gaslighting component because that's, gaslighting where people are guilty and then they try to put a spin on somebody bringing to light what they did. Isn't that funny? They, people want to play the, the cancer cancel culture card or, or, or premise from a, from a deception oriented perspective. But then when you say what somebody did do and it's accurate, uh, especially if they're the guilty party, they want everybody not to look at that. But at any rate, we we're all doing a show and we were doing the show for a while. I think I left the show roughly a year ago. I think, and it was, it's interesting how there was somebody who used to support all of us. I don't know what happened. I don't know what somebody did. Uh, I know that you couldn't pay me to disrespect anybody. And, And if I do reject someone or choose to not be associated or, or anything of that nature, it's going to be because somebody actually did do something I leave room for that person to recover themselves. Everybody has 
uh, uh, should be given a chance to change their mode of thinking. Everybody should be given a chance to change the beat of their drum, the beat of the drum that they answer to. So if somebody did something incorrect a year from now, six months from now, six days from now, that person could change. You got to give a person a chance to do that. That's just the only, only the fair and the humane thing to do. So I don't know what went into this cancel culture scenario that took place, but somebody labeled Debbie, Dr. Nick and I as a pack of wild dogs. I don't know where the accusation came from. I don't know what anybody did. I didn't do anything. I don't behave. I think everybody listening to this show, people who interact with me and who are honest will say, you never see me do anything reflective where somebody could say that I'm part of a pack of wild dogs and it'd be accurate. I'm not, that's not me. Um, and, and I've never seen the other two people that I just mentioned do anything of that sort to act like a pack of wild dogs. It's just that this person just all of a sudden, who was a huge supporter of what we were doing, all of a sudden started talking about how we were a pack of wild dogs, went and blocked all of us, and 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 then goes around telling other people that we're a pack of wild dogs, which is how we found that out. Even though there's zero evidence for such, a, and and I, I can't speak for everybody because uh, I don't know what happened in private conversations, but I know that in whether my engagements with people are personal or if or if they're public, um, nobody can say truly that I've behaved. In an, in an unhumane, in a disrespectful manner toward anyone at any time, even, even the people that I would classify as enemies. I don't even behave like that toward my enemies. So, um, but this person, through whatever they felt was done that gave them cause to go around and start publishing such, that's an act of cancel culture, of course, because they go around telling people and they don't want other people to partake of what it is that we're doing. And, and so that's deceitful because the information that went into it is inaccurate. This is just one example. This is happening a lot. I've got some other examples I'm going to share on this episode. But, folks, this is happening a lot. Um, I've had people come to me and try to engage in cancel culture against other people. And so I'm going to suggest you do what I do. When somebody comes to me, number one, I'm going to be fair. So when somebody comes to me about something somebody else did, I want to see evidence. I want to, I want to know why you feel that way. I want to make sure that you're not being somebody that's, that's not demonstrating emotional intelligence. I want to make sure that you're being equitable. And I'm going to ask for that. When people, when I find out that somebody is presenting something to me and it's not accurate, I am not going to take action on that, and I'm going to hold the person who's trying to recruit me to the little army of, of, of no-gooders, frankly. Um, I'm going to hold them accountable, and if necessary, we're going to part company at that point because I refuse to be a part of engaging in character assassination against somebody else, especially in UX because we can't afford that. There's too much of this, this cancel culture and character assassination happening in the discipline today, and it's costing us. It's hurting us bad. It needs to stop. And you're going to see through some of these, some of these other examples that I'm going to share in this episode what I mean by things like this. Matter of fact, that takes me into the second example I wanted to share because there was a, a situation where, um, I mean, I'm part of some of you listening to this to this show, know that I'm a part of the American Board of Design and Research. We call it AMBOD for short, A-M-B-O-D. And part of our initiative is uh, one of the main goals is to provide some stabilization for the discipline, to provide licensure, to, to try to, to, to introduce licensure to this discipline so we can have some standardization so you can look and see, hey, this person has a license. They've taken a, a, a test, a proctored test, that, and, and through that test, 
this proves that this person is qualified to work in this field, just like they do with other fields. And, and it's not just lawyers and doctors. There's a lot of fields that require something like this. We've been suffering for too long with people who just falsify their way into roles and, and creating problems for all of us. I mean, we've gotten to the point now where so many people think that non-UXers are really UXers that it's difficult for a real UXer to get a role. It's difficult, especially if it's leadership oriented because they, they think that, that we are overqualified or something of that sort. I, I see all these manager roles where people want someone with five years of experience but if a person with 15 or 20 years of experience applies, they don't want that person. That makes no sense. It makes no sense at all. But it's happening a lot. But at any rate, because that's another that's another note. A person came to me because they reach out to the person who is the founder. I'll uh, shout out to Jonathan Bowman. A person reached out to Jonathan and said that they didn't like the conversation that they had with him. And here's where it begins. This person who will always tell me how much they trusted me and how much they valued my opinion and all these types of things, that I don't care how you, I'm talking to everybody right now, I don't care how much you regard me, if you come to me and you bring a, a tainted platform, a skewed, a biased platform, I am going to call you out. I'm going to hold you accountable. I'm going to be your friend by telling you what you need to hear in a given situation. So this person who had all of those claims, oh, I respect you so much, blah, blah, blah. And, and, and for those you who don't know, I've been doing counseling for over 40 years. So I read people really, really, really well. So I don't play the games. Just been dealing with people too long from that perspective. I was, I've been doing counseling longer than I've been doing UX. And so the person goes to tell me how they had this conversation with Jonathan and how the conversation went sideways and what they didn't like about the conversation. And I know Jonathan better than that. The things this person was telling me, that's not his character. That's not the way that he carries himself. So no, no, no. Too, too professional, too fair, just too humane. No, I, 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 no I'm not buying that. And, and you got to bring a little bit more than that. Because I, I know too much that counters that. And, and the person then went on to, to levy several accusations. Uh, and in particular, so how come you folks? How come you folks don't have any females on your board? I can't tell you how much we tried to find female board members. <laughs> I can't tell you how much. You know, sometimes people will just criticize at the surface because of what they don't see, but they have no knowledge of, of the work. Or, or, or I'm sorry, criticize because of what they do see. Let's correct that, but don't understand what they don't see. And and most times. That's what happens. People look at something and they judge a book by its cover and you actually need to understand what's going on under the cover. So I shared what was going on behind the scenes, the efforts, and the person just didn't want to hear it. And, and then I kept, I, I kept trying to share with the person, this is how you should approach it. This is what we're doing. Be patient with us. We're doing X, Y, and Z. We're going to get there. But what we're doing, you have to agree that what we're doing is something that's much needed. In the discipline, the person didn't want to hear anything that I was saying. So here's this biased mindset, only wanting to hear what they want to hear. And, and, and we're going back and forth. I'm like, okay, it's time for me to go to work. I need to, I can't keep responding. I can't let you take up my morning. I've got things I've got to do. And I didn't announce that. I just started doing my work. And I guess the person, I don't know. I, guess I didn't respond after one of their last posts, so they got angry. Then they went out and they started blocking me and all this type of thing. I didn't do anything to deserve any of that. But if you block me, that's fine. That's your prerogative. You that you you can do that. If that's what you choose to do, then fine. More power to you. Wish wish you all the best. Have a nice life. And and you know we move on. I'm not bitter. I don't. I'm, I'm not really concerned about that. But the funny thing is, I finally go back and I tell Jonathan what happened. And when I tell Jonathan what happened and I share the sentiments, statements, I'm going to remember what you said, exactly what you said, how you said it. So I'm going to hear the punctuation in your voice and everything, and I'm going to share exactly that. And I found out that the person did not represent the story properly. The person was actually demanding to become a board member. 
and, and and under the guise of having some female representation on the board. Uh, I wonder why they didn't tell me that. I wonder why they chose to misrepresent what really happened. I wonder why they, I mean, when you tell somebody what happened, when you're transparent, you're respecting the person that you're engaging with. I hope people understand that. That's part of my emotional intelligence model. You got to be transparent. If you're not willing to be transparent, but you're willing to try to skew things and try to manipulate somebody, there's something else going on there. And if something else is going on and you don't respect somebody enough to share what's going on, there's basically a problem. So we, uh, we got to be concerned about things like that. So, now, I'm sure that person, because that person has come to, came to me multiple times over the last three years or so, trying to get me to wage war against somebody, which I never opted into. I listen to their stories, share some things with them from time to time, but I'm not, I'm not here for that. I, I'm, I'm not here. I'm not going to gossip. I'm not going to play games. I don't want to, it's it just all these weird things. Now, when, I, when I'm not here to listen to what you have to say, and respond in kind, then my name is Mud now, and now I'm sure that they've gone around and try to tell other people that they shouldn't listen. So this is that that deceitfulness of cancel cancel culture, especially from the perspective when people have a sense of entitlement, and then they try to execute cancel culture based on that entitlement. No, we're not we're not playing those games today. But this is quite prevalent. And this is just one example. I, I've had this happen several times. I've seen this many, many, many times in in my days in UX, and it's just a really strange thing. Another example, speaking of that, I once worked at a company, and and, and you have to pardon me if, if, if this bothers you. I'm telling you a lot of things that I've observed. The funny thing about that is I can tell you things that I've observed. I can tell you about things that stories I've heard from other people but when it comes to my observations in particular, some people want to discard my observations. And it's funny. That's actually also racist because they'll listen to somebody else and go, oh, wow, when that person says it. But then when I say it, uh, and I have talked to people before, I, I talked to somebody once about something I observed at a company I worked at. I saw something within the department that was problematic. And I'm trying to, I want to respect the person who's the leader to make them aware of it because I know that it's their job to manage it. I know I've been in your shoes. I know what the responsibilities are. I figure you want to know. I don't have the authority to deal with it, but you do. So I'm going to let you know about it. I can provide you with more data later if you need it. So you can be objective about it, but I'm trying to let you know. And then to have somebody come back and tell you, or basically, uh, you know, that's your perception. I've never seen that and, and dismissed it. So that's something that happens more when you are a minority if you are female, it's more likely to happen. Uh, if you're a minority, people will blow you off and whatever you perceive, the people will tell you that perception is reality or they'll say your perception, yada, 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 until you fall into a certain classification and then everybody wants to blow blow off whatever the perception is. So so you can blow this off if you want to. It's just going to come back and bite you. So just, just warning you about that now. That said, I once worked at a company do what you will with my observations. I worked at a company where I was the first genuine UX hire that they had other than the director. I was the first person to be brought into this particular company after they had gone through a bankruptcy. The company was trying to keep from hiring real UX people. They didn't want to spend the money. This is about the time that stuff was starting to change or so when companies, they didn't want to spend money. So they would, they would spend less money and bring in somebody that could basically breathe UX to fill a spot. And even though they weren't going to bring a lot of value, that's the way that a lot of companies were doing it. Now it's an everyday thing. You see it at almost every job posting out there. They're going to do that. So I come into this company, the first person that actually was a, a person with prior UX experience. And as I come in, the first thing they do was give me this really huge, high-profile project for an uh, English as a second language platform. Some of you are going to know who I'm talking about now when I say that. And so the first thing I do, as is usual and should be with everyone in such case as this, uh, I 
began doing a heuristic evaluation. And as I did the heuristic evaluation, and I had approximately 45 pages of findings and recommendations. And the team knew about it. I went to present the deck to the team. And they did not tell me that they were inviting executives to this to this presentation. I didn't find out until after the fact. Long story short, the execs heard the presentation. They were able to learn what UX was through my presentation. They said, wow, and this is a multi-million dollar project. And they're going, wow, this is what UX can do for us? It blew the door off. It just, it opened the door. In other words, it they were sold on the value of UX through that presentation. And our team went from having about five people to somewhere between 12 to 15 in our current location. It just, boom, just go ahead. Gave the director a blank check. and But what they did was, instead of hiring full-time people, they hired a bunch of contractors at the time. I guess they couldn't go hook, line, and sinker and, and do what they wanted. And so everybody was brought in, was contractor, but the team grew at like almost tripled in size. Um, that's a good success story, right? Well, we're talking about the deceitfulness of cancel culture, right? So you know what's about to happen. So basically, these people, these contractors that came in, and, and really, I think it was all of them that came in, including some of the ones that were already there, who were posers, retrofits, and upstarts, they banded together, and for some reason, they looked at me, I'm the one who did the work that caused them to get the job, but they didn't know this, nor did they care. They came through the door, and it was almost like, here's your job description, work on project A, B, C, and D, and, uh, you know, make sure you spend a good chunk of your week trying to destroy Darren Hood because that's all these people did. And they banded together. It turned into a mob. My project is successful. The data that's coming from the research is validating design direction. Everything that was happening in my, with my work was fine. These people, not only did these people waste a bunch of time in trying to destroy me, fast forward a bit. They were all let go within a matter of a handful of months because nobody was bringing any value. <laughs> it was they weren't doing anything, and and they'd sit around and and get angry because you put on headphones. Because some of the people would play music. We all worked at a table in an agile environment, so we all sit at this one big table, and and they would play music thinking that that was helping the atmosphere as if everybody is you. Everybody's not you. Any of you out there, if you're doing that, please don't do that. Everybody doesn't want to hear your music. Everybody doesn't want to hear X, Y, and Z. Some people want quiet. Everybody has different needs from a working standpoint. And I certainly didn't want to hear all of that. And so I spent good money on, on, I, matter of fact, I already did. I had, I brought them from the other place of work, the one I had just left not too long before that and, and got even some more. And and here I am with my head canceling headphones on and or, or sound canceling headphones, noise canceling headphones. Technically, that's what that's what you call it. <laughs> and yeah, you knew what I meant. And I hope so. And uh, getting angry because I'm wearing the noise canceling headphones. And uh, never mind the fact that I gave a pair away. Just gave them away because if somebody else wanted some, and I knew what was going on with them financially at the time, so I just volunteered to help somebody. Here, here's a pair of $300 headphones, no strings attached. Enjoy. This kind of thing. And people were angry with me. This is the kind of crazy, backwards kind of stuff that, that happens in, in UX today. And so these people banded against me. They all ended up getting laid off. And But the thing is, why was this type of a behavior acceptable? Because even the director wasn't doing anything about it, which is pretty mad. I even found out about one of them who it was almost like they would meet with the director on a regular basis, and part of what they always wanted to talk about was how to get rid of Darren Hood, even though they had no case for it. And this information was given to me by the person because that director left and another director took over, director, manager, and... And like, and he would wonder why this person is doing this. That particular person wasn't doing any work at all. But yet, 
they wanted to throw me under the rug. So this this is the kind of stuff, the, the internal cancel culture, if you will, internal hostility, just really crazy stuff. But it is common today. I have talked to other people that have that have. I think I shared one story last week a little bit about a person where there's a bunch of juniors at one place of employment with working with a senior and they spend a chunk of their time during the week trying to do something to get the manager to get rid of the senior the senior hasn't done anything wrong this is one of the other things about this give me a chance give me a chance give me a chance give me a chance thing that's going on sort of veer off to another topic that's going to come up later as we're wrapping up the series but, you know, it, this, well, let's stop all this, give me a chance, give me a chance, give me a chance, give me a chance, when a lot of these give me a chance, give me a chance, give me a chance, give me a chance people come on board, and then all they do is try to destroy somebody else. So th- it's crazy, folks, and you, you you may not have experienced it, but some of us are. Please know and understand that, and it, it's wrong, it's sad, and it's not helping the discipline. Everybody got that. It's not helping the discipline. So these mobs in the workplace that are trying to cancel, subject somebody to internal cancel culture. Just another sign these things are happening. Another weird one. They're all weird. (laughs) But the situation where people will claim that a person said something that they didn't say, and then they take the thing that they claim the person said, build a platform, a discussion, around this this statement that was imagined and in some cases willfully concocted they know you didn't say it but they're going to say that you said it anyway and then people know that the thing that somebody claimed that you said is crazy and some of them know you didn't say it too but they just want to come at you anyway so that just becomes an excuse for the hostility and the toxicity that's at foot and and now you've got toxic work environments or toxic interactions things of that nature. And this has happened to me. Two examples that, that come to mind for me, both, well, one happened after I did a talk and one happened after a social media post, but these are just two examples. This probably happened to me a hundred times. And I did a talk about information architecture once. And in this talk, I had stated, some of you probably heard the talk before, it's basically called Long Live Information Architecture. I've delivered the talk two or three times uh, with one variant where I, I specified and focused on social media for the folks at Tech Circus over in the UK. But when I delivered this talk once, there was someone who, after the talk, they they basically would talk about how much they enjoyed the talk, but they had an issue with it, and they wanted to talk to me about the issue. If that happens, uh, number one, um, cool. If you want to talk about it, I can do that. Uh, Number two, you need to know something about the way I operate. My modus operandi is that if you don't know, don't say. So if you come to talk to me about something I said, uh, I hope it's to get some clarity because I'm not going to get in front of you and say something that's not accurate. So, And I know that, so I'm not going to be gaslit. I'm not going to get into a conversation with somebody. I see gaslighting coming a mile away. I'm not going to get into a conversation where you're going to gaslight me and I'm agreeing with what you made up. So those games we don't play. And that's what this person did. In that talk, I said that the main product of IA is findability. You can go and find this talk anywhere. You'll hear me say it. You'll see it in the deck. The main talk is findability. Through the nomenclature, through the taxonomies, the information set that's set, now people can... Uh, find what they're looking for. You optimize findability. That's what we want to deliver through a sound information architecture. And I said it over and over and over again. And the person kept coming to me saying that I said something completely different and and said it multiple times. And, and I've seen this before. We have a conversation and, and you're going to tell me six or seven times that I said something that I know I didn't say. And then want to have a conversation with me revolving around what you said that I said that I didn't say. And I'm sure that person went and talked to other people about how he tried to straighten Darren Hood out. No, because Darren Hood doesn't tolerate guff off of Darren Hood, and Darren Hood will straighten himself out long before you ever can even consider it. I just don't play that game with myself. I don't tolerate it for myself. 
So there's no door for you to come through to to help me out with that thing you want to pretend that you're helping me out with, which is also racist because people don't think that black folks know how to. I'm not completely black, by the way, just in case you didn't know that, but whatever. <laughs> the, uh, I'm not 100% African-American, but it, it's, it's funny how people always want to, they, they see you as African-American, so they're going to talk to you based on their African-American stereotypes and biases. And the thought, the, the stereotype for African-Americans is that we, we don't know how to follow directions. We're going to be hard-headed. We're going to be late all the time, all these other little stereotypical things, of which I am none of those things. So that's not going to fly uh, as well. Uh, and, and it's sad how this person did that and then tried to cast aspersions about the talk because that person is held as in regard as an expert on the subject of information architecture. And interestingly, that very self same company, the, the person that, 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 that the company that person works for, ironically, um, I interviewed at the, their company, really going to let the cat out of the bag with this, but I interviewed at their company at one time, and I always held them a very high regard, and I thought it was going to be just fantastic to be able to work with them, and I'm only going to tell part of this story. It's ironic that that person did what he did trying to gaslight me because they also abused me during the interviewing process. They actually, I was told that they wanted to hire me, but they kept, they just couldn't believe that I was legit. So they went through and did all these things to find out if I was really legit and found out that I was. They went through that, that grapevine of, uh, of that, that unofficial communication channel, found out that I was legit but they just couldn't bring themselves to deal with the fact that I was legit. So they changed the job rec and hired a person with a tenth of my experience. So, which I, I met that person later and I just chuckled when I found out what they did. But, so I'm not surprised. So what, for whatever reason, uh, and I, it was probably more racially motivated than anything else, you've got this person who, again, went out and started letting people know my talk is this, that, and the other, even though they can hear the talk and judge for themselves, but they're going to listen to this person because they're supposedly a guru. Well, they are a guru when it comes to information architecture. So there's some cancel culture that happens there. And and there was a, a post that I did recently on B2B and B2C. Uh, it was the topic that came up. And I was talking about how one company where I worked and a person was in charge of research. And I'm going to do the research. And, you know, I really didn't need the person's help. So the person was feeling bad and was accusing me of not including them on anything. Well, I didn't need you. Everybody else is needy. I've been doing research for almost 30 years. I, I don't really need your help. I can keep you in the loop on things, but I don't need you to help me with it. I just don't have the need. So now, so I'm not needy. So now you're going to criticize me because I'm not needy. That's a bit, that's a bit crazy, but that's not the point I'm trying to get at. The point I'm trying to get at is that the person in finding out about one of the projects and trying to sort of prepare as if they're going to help out. And I'm, the whole time, I don't don't need your help. <laughs> the person uh, asked me the question, and they said, "So tell me, are, are we going to be? Uh, is this going to be the the research? Is it going to be B two B focus, or is it going to be B two C focus? Who are we going to be conducting the research with?" And and I'm thinking, we're going to conduct research with users. If they're if it's B two B, we're still talking to users. If we're if we're B two C. We're still talking to users, but then, but the reason that I was sort of bewildered was because all of the research that we conducted that was being done through user zoom was all B to C. It was all with end users. We wanted to know how end users were going to interact with a solution so we could go back and, and inform the business how we recommended they should proceed. So there wasn't any time that that wasn't happening. The person was asking the weird question because they wanted to play a game. Because they wanted to, to implement a power play. And then what the person did do was go back. So this is two stories in one. Go back to the director and try to cast aspersions. Again, engaging in internal cancel culture at the job. And and, and this is where they, they do things to try to to make you look bad, try to put you in a negative light at the job, which detri detrimentally impacts your, your professionalism or your career aspirations. Folks, that's a cancer that is that is creating a lot of problems today for a lot of UXers out there under the sound of my voice. 
and that kind of stuff needs to needs to cease. But the other, the flip side of the story, the main part was that I'm talking about. That's told this story on on LinkedIn, and then here's somebody, same thing, comes along, and I said that whether it's B to C or, or B to B, they're still addressing users. I didn't address details. You only have so many characters. I explain this all the time. And trolls always come along and act like you have 10,000 characters to explain something. And even if you did, who's going to read a long post? So I'm glad that there are limitations, character limitations on posts, because now you've got to say what you got to say within a certain amount of time. So you got to choose, okay, what is it that you're going to express? What is it you're going to share? And we're going to go with that. And so that's what happened. And uh, that was really great. I was able to, to get my point across, but this person comes along and makes these statements and casts aspersions, even going as far to execute full-blown cancel culture entitled and try to say that we shouldn't be telling uh, new UXers that, that they're all the same. That's just irresponsible. Wow, really? You're going to go for the jugular? You don't know the details. And the funny thing is, the person used his character's to explain his perspective. But the thing is, his perspective, if I had the space and if it would have been doable or or the right thing to do, I would have said the same exact thing. So this person didn't bother to find out what I meant, didn't really bother to to find out what was behind the statement. They just decided to, we're going to cancel Darren Hood right here, right now. Folks, that kind of stuff. And, and, And as I've said before, and I say again, that person was a former creative director and a former art director, and you do not find, it's not very often, if you are a former creative director or former art director and you understand UX, I'm happy for you. Please know you are in the minority. The vast majority of former art directors and former creative directors are the enemies of UX and don't want anything to do with real UX whatsoever and don't want anything to do with people who are really skilled and know what we're talking about, and they always do what they can to destroy us. So, and he was another one of those people. So he tried to use his entitlement to, to issue a, a passive aggressive cancel order on me. Uh, and I just blocked him and went on my way and explained that I was, if I could, I would have said the same exact thing. I know that, that you have to understand your users. That that's, that's a base, a base thing that we talk about. And we know you have to understand their needs, but that was actually my point that if it is a business user, whether it's a business user or a a consumer, they each have a set of needs, and you have to work to find out what those needs are. So to me, it's you simplify it by saying they're all users. So now you're always going to find out what the needs of the users are. So what's what's the difference? I found from a practical perspective, it doesn't really benefit you to try to classify who they are. Just if they're users, find out what their specific and exclusive needs are, and then proceed from there. And things are great at that from that perspective uh it's funny how people a lot of times they'll they'll hijack posts and play the same cancel game they will you're talking about the topic a b and c they come along and introduce def there's times when you can introduce a different topic when sort of like off the beaten path but when you they try to take it and then the whole thing is going in that direction and then they flip and they try to to act like the fact that you didn't cover the topics that they felt were important, that we shouldn't be listening to you, that's that's inappropriate. And, and a lot of folks on social media lack social skills, and we need to know and understand that. Three more examples, uh, and these are going to be really as quick as I can because we're, we're already at the 48-minute mark here uh, of the, the content portion of the, of the episode. There was a situation where there was a person, I would post something, talk about hijacking posts, I would post something and the person would always hijack it and take the post in a different direction. And I would call the person out for doing such. And the person would always turn it into some type of a, a comedy type of thing. And and like, and I'm serious about what I'm sharing. And this person's turning it into something else and sort of making the post about them. I mean, if you want to talk about this, go post something (laughs) that's on your feed and let people come interact with that, but don't come and take, my post and make it your platform. Uh, nobody should do that. I'm not going to do it to anybody else and nobody should do it to me. Nobody should be doing it to anybody for that matter. And, and the person started becoming more insulting, very difficult. 
to interact with, very cantankerous. And then one day the person came to, like when I used to have the UX Chit Chat Hour, the person came to the UX Chit Chat Hour and trolled me at the event live. And I said, you know what? That's it. It's over. And, and I was done with that person. I gave that person enough rope. Uh, I gave that person, I was patient with that person already enough. I'm done now. If, if your behaviors cause me to have to engage in work that I'm not being paid to do, uh, then I'm done. I, I, I don't spend any kind of time. I have zero tolerance for trolls. And so I blocked the person. Well, the person wasn't happy <laughs> that I had blocked them. And they passively, aggressively tried to cancel me. Now, funny thing is, a lot of people, they didn't bother opting in because they know me too well. But you can tell that they're still influenced to some degree because now they sort of hang a little bit looser than they used to. They used to be closer. They used to interact a lot. But then they started sort of like they, they, they keep a presence, but they don't really involve themselves with anything that I'm doing. So you could tell that they've been impacted. And if they hear this, which they probably won't, because they won't listen to the show, uh, then they know. I, I'm aware. I, just because I didn't say anything doesn't mean I don't know. Uh, and it's blatantly obvious. And then that person started going around to people, telling them that I blocked them, campaigning. Please go and talk to Darren and ask Darren to unblock me. They even went as far as, in one instance, but please, uh, you know, I think Darren blocked me by mistake. <laughs> really? If you're blocked, you, you were not blocked by mistake. It's funny how they spin everything. Uh, so they're either either you're going to unblock me or I'm going to get you canceled is, is the tone that started coming through that type of behavior. And, and, and shame on the folks who believed it. The person even went as far as talking to my then boss at the time and trying to get my boss to convince me. Like, wow, okay. So I don't have a mind on my own is what you're saying. Uh, and that was also racist of that person to have done something like that, which is funny because that person's a minority. But it, it's just really sad when you have minorities that subject uh, other minorities to to maltreatment. That, that really says a lot about who they are. Uh, and, and I'm saying that from an EQ perspective as well as a, a people manager perspective. So just really sad. And, and the person keeps they want to ride the coattails of others. Hey, you know, let me stop there. I'm not going to get into it. That's just an example of cancel culture, folks. And, and it really, it shouldn't be the case. Another example, and, and then we've got one more, uh, where there was a person who profits off of the zeal of new UXers to the extent that they'll, I have seen the person look at different things that, UXers have an affinity for or are afraid of and then use that to market and draw them in. Most notably, I've seen people, high profile people, embrace the definition, the, the crowdsourced definition of gatekeeping, which is not accurate, by the way, and then post things to get people who are afraid of gatekeeping because of people always sharing that kind of information, false information about gatekeeping. And then rope them into uh, their their uh, whirlwind of e-commerce, if you will. Uh, I even saw and what the person did to me was the person. I have screenshots of it. The person actually took one of my posts, reordered what I said. They didn't take a screenshot of it. They they took the words, reordered them to make it look like I said something completely different, which a lot of people were going to feel offended by what was said. And then he said, so now that you're offended, uh, I have the elixir for your offense. Come to me and I will teach you this kind of thing. So they basically canceled me and then tried to make a profit off of it. And, and, and this is somebody who's been doing UX for, for some, some time. Oh, and by the way, I did reach out to the person. So I'm completely free and clear to talk about this the way I'm talking about. Same for the last person, too, because they know what they did. And, and, and the person would not, they ghosted me. When I tried to talk to them about it, they would not talk to me. I didn't say what you said. Why are you doing that? This isn't accurate. Why are you doing that? They just ignored me. So so now the person's name is Mud. And to me, the person's name is Mud. And, and, and that person is a threat to the well-being of the discipline and, and folks. And, and, and sometimes people say, well, Darren, tell us who it is. No, I'm not going to do that. And the reason that I don't get so involved um, 
with regard to, or so much get involved in the who of the thing as the what, because there are, there's more than one person guilty of these things I'm talking about. If you focus on a personality, you'll know that that person did it, but you won't see the next 50 people who do. So it's very, very important to understand the concept that's wrong, that thing that we should be avoiding, that thing that we shouldn't be doing, and make sure we don't duplicate those behaviors and attitudes. It doesn't matter who does it. It, It's completely out of order. Last example for this show and how the, the canceling, and this is happening to me at the on the teaching level for those you don't know uh, I'm on the books teaching at six universities Uh, I'm actively teaching at at three at the present time four actually Uh, I mean that doesn't mean I'm teaching four classes it means that I'm on the books and could be called upon to teach at any given time at these four universities the four of the six and and I there was one university I used to teach at and it was funny how that the person who was running the program left to take over a program at another university. And I've told this story before, but I, I didn't share it from a cancel perspective. And this actually could branch out multiple ways. But at any rate, uh, the person that took over knew nothing about UX. They just sort of inherited the program. My name had been submitted previously to take the program over, actually. I think that person was probably offended by that. So, uh, and what I've seen over the course of my career, once somebody is offended or threatened by you, you're about to have a hard way to go here moving forward because there a lot of people are, are part of a lot of people have not changed since they were five years old. There's still that nasty little kid that did all the little dirty underhanded things when they were five. Uh, sad to say a lot of people are still that person and you can see it. And when it, when you see it, Uh, Put your seatbelt on and be constructive as you can be because you're going to have a a rough way to go. And and so this person, knowing that I was put was it was recommended, at least I was told I was recommended to take it over. uh, And that's fine. I don't care if somebody I I, I don't care about any of that. That's not my thing. And, And I'm not offended by it. And I'm not a narcissist. And I'm not I'm not stuck on. It's got to be me. None of those things. And and so. But I was hoping to potentially move there full-time, overtime. But at any rate, um, when the new person took over, the person asked me to document this one course that I didn't have a a special set of slides that I operated under. And and I was teaching the whole class from the hip based on what I knew. I was teaching the class. And this person asked me to document everything. And I balked at that request. I didn't balk at that request because I am am uh, difficult, uh, as that person assumed. Because again, it was another racist. Uh, <laughs> Going to think black people are always difficult. Yada yada yada. Angry black man. No, I balked because I knew, and he had confessed as much that he was in the process of trying to bring in his fellow PhD graduates from another university to come and teach courses in this program. Even though none of them knew anything about UX, I knew that they were about to run the program in the ground. And I wasn't going to help them do it. I was not going to help them do it. How, what would you do if you were in that situation? Well, I got labeled to be the bad guy because I refused to help him destroy the UX program at that at that university. And, and so I got labeled, and, and, and this came out. I was told by someone else uh, that he told them, he, he blackballed me because I wouldn't do it. Now, I left the university already. I, I resigned, like, I think the next day because I said I refuse to work with him because he's not, he's, not, he's not good for UX. He's good for putting money in his pocket, but he's not good for UX, and I refuse to help him. And so uh, the per- uh, someone else came to me and told me what he did. So this is not me imagining anything. This person basically subjected me to cancel culture by by basically removing any endorsement that I had to teach. And, and I've had this happen to me at two universities now where someone engaged in cancel culture behavior based on something I didn't do, not based on anything where I merited such a reaction. And so this, this cancel culture thing, it's happening all over. 
And, and as you can see, it's not just in doing the work. It's the reputation that you have in the discipline. It's the reputation I have as an instructor. And, and my students love me. Even, even where that happened, the students love me. Although any student that got subjected to the the any type of the maltreatment, they don't anymore because they believe the the rhetoric. I had one one person who said that I was pontificating. When I talk like this, I'm pontificating. This is not pontificating. I said in uh, a week ago on social media, if the things I'm warning people about, if something is not done about this stuff, there is going to be a huge problem because it's going to eat the discipline up. It's going to chew it up and spit it out. These, so this is not pontificating. These are things that need attention, and those of us that are more seasoned bear the greater responsibility of riding the ship with regard to these things. But when you have people, we seniors, seasoned people are not allowed to operate. We're not allowed to get certain jobs. We're not allowed to teach. We're not allowed to do certain things. None of these things, and I'm not the only person who suffered this either. A lot of these things I'm talking about, are contributing to the current state of the discipline Why I'm doing that talk in Austria and, and hoping that more people will get on board to help us right these ships. Uh, these things are inappropriate. They're inaccurate. But if we band together, if we first make ourselves a committee of one to not be contributors to such behaviors and make ourselves a committee of one not to tolerate it from other people when we see it, that's something that will lend itself to fostering a healthier world of UX for everybody going forward. Folks, that's it for this segment on the cancel culture, the deceitfulness of cancel culture in the world of UX today. Let's try to right the ship, folks. Anybody with me out there? I hope so. So that's it for today. And until next time. This is Darren Hood. I am the host of the world of UX. Glad you took the time to join us on today. And until next time, happy UXing, everybody. Thanks for joining us for this session of CX of M Radio. Be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to the show and visit cxofm.org for more resources.